Hey, I'm going to let people in. Thanks, everyone. All right, so I'd like to welcome everybody to today's live conversation about race and racism in Canadian post-secondary education and beyond that is a collaboration between McEwen University and The Conversations Canada. Uh, my name is uh, Craig Zemsky. I'm the Associate Vice President, Associate Vice President Research at McEwen University. I would like to start by acknowledging that the land on which we gather in Treaty 6 territory is the traditional gathering place for many Indigenous people. We honor and respect the history, the languages, ceremonies, and culture of the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, which, who call this territory home. The First Peoples' connection to the land teaches us about our inherent responsibility to protect and respect Mother Earth. With this acknowledgement, we honor the ancestors and children who have been buried here, missing and murdered Indigenous women and men, and the process of ongoing healing for all human beings. We are all reminded that we are all treaty people and of the responsibility we have to one another. So again, I'd like to welcome you to the next event in the uh, the webinar series that I've kind of been formally calling McEwen in the mix events. Um, these conversational events have brought together McEwen faculty, staff with various community partners to discuss pressing societal issues to allow us to see these issues in a different light so we can better understand the issues and ultimately try to work collaboratively towards uh, common solutions. Um, I always say universities are a microcosm for what occurs, what happens in society. And I think for us to be relevant, we need to put ourselves out there and be in the mix. So today's event was coordinated at McCune University uh, through the Office of Human Rights, Diversity and Equity and the Office of Research Services working in collaboration with the Conversation Canada. So I will just briefly introduce our two uh, conversationalists and then I will turn it over to President Trimby and Ms. Srivastava. So Dr. Annette Trimby is the President and Vice Chancellor at McCune University. Uh, she has a wealth of experience and knowledge, both as a, as a leader in both the post-secondary and the public sector. Um, in addition to being a very accomplished academic, she spent nearly 30 years building a career with the government of Alberta. She's the current chair of the Canadian Research Knowledge Network, uh, which is a partnership of Canadian universities that is dedicated to expanding digital content for academic research and teaching in Canada. She's on the board of directors for the Conversation Canada as well as very recently, as we know, serving as the chair of the City of Edmonton's Community Safety and Wellbeing Task Force. Uh, Benita Srivastava is a journalist, educator, and media innovator with experience in South Asia, South Africa, and North America. She's reported and edited for the New York Times Magazine, Vibe, The Village Voice, and Savoy. She co-hosts the Asia Pacific Forum at WBAI Radio and Masala Mix at CKLN uh, for over a decade. And she's also taught media for non-government organizations in Canada, the US and Rwanda, as well as teaching at Ryerson uh, School of Journalism as a professor of journalism. So I will uh, now turn the conversation over to Dr. Trimby and Ms. Sri Thanks, Craig. Thank that was a great introduction. It's nice to be here and uh, thank you very much for the invitation to McEwen University and to everybody who helped put this together and organize it um, from the conversation and also at McEwen. Uh, my name is Vinita Srivastava and I I'm going to be a little bit less formal, Craig, then if you don't mind, I'm going to go right into it. This is the podcast world and in the podcasting world, we normally don't have um, a, <laughs> we normally don't have a visual and um, I've had some of my guests who've told me that they've actually spoken to me with the headphones on while lying on the ground uh -huh. or sitting on the couch. <laughs> so we're just trying to get into kind of an intimate space with each other and I am um, invite you all to join us and along on the journey. And we are here today to talk about some of the issues around race and racism. That is what our podcast Don't Call Me Resilient is about. Um, but we also want to get into some of the everyday, you know, challenges that we're facing in our lives. So I know, Annette, that you're a supreme and expert organizer and leader. And 
um, I am going to really ask you some of those really pressing, curious conversations mm -hmm. that we're all having with each other right now, which is how can we make our Zoom lives better? <laughs> how can we run a meeting that's interesting? Those are some of the, the just personal, like selfish questions that I have for you. But I'm going to jump into our conversation today, um, which is about the role of the university and the role of the university and the future of the city and how these things are connected. As Craig says, we have some responsibility for those of us in universities and having grown up in an academic family, I, I take this very personally as well. Um, but some people think of universities as places of education and they are places of education. Of course they are that, but they're also so much more than that. They can be so much more than that. And they're called upon to be so much more than that as I'm sure President Trimby and Annette, you can tell us all about the pressures to be excellent in research, to be amazing um, in business, real estate players, you know, real estate acquisition, to, to survive as businesses. Um, these are all some of the pressures that universities face. Um, but um, we also have to be good at change when we're talking about universities. And we are in the middle of massive changes right now. Um, we are six years past the, the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation, the 94 calls to action, six years past that. Um, where are we now on those 94 calls to action? And university has been called um, to integrate many of these as many of these actions have to do with education. And we're also in the middle of a year of what um, many are calling a year of racial reckoning. And what is the role of the university? When we spoke last week, Edette, you said this has really been on your mind a lot, which is what is the role of the university in the, as a, what's the role of the recovery? What role can the university play in the recovery of some of these things? And I say recovery in kind of a, a very large way. Um, so universities are called to be part of this change. Um, and many, many people challenge the idea that universities must do more than merely reside in the city that they belong to. They must actually take part in, in the city. They must integrate with it. And they must take part in, in having a role in part of its social change. And um, I'm really excited to be here today with Annette because Annette is someone who really embodies this idea of really wanting to take the university out into the world and out into the city and see what kind of impact uh, the university and the city can have together in terms of imagining the future of the city. Well, we're really in a moment. I know the kids right now don't use the word pandemic. Like they say things like panini. Apparently saying panini instead of pandemic takes the pressure off of what we're talking about, but we are in the middle of this panini pandemic. And we, we do have to sort of, we are facing so many things um, that we have to talk about, so many challenges. So I just, I'm gonna reiterate again some of the things that I said earlier on and Craig has introduced me, but I'll start again with that, which is my name is Vinita Srivastava. I'm the host of a new podcast about race at The Conversation Canada, which is called Don't Call Me Resilient. Um, it, it, we do tackle some deep issues about race and racism. Um, and joining me today live, um, my co-host for, for the afternoon or for the morning is uh, President Annette Trimby, who's, as you know, president of McEwen University. So thanks for having this conversation with me, Annette, and thanks for sparking the conversation. So although, Annette, you've only been the president of McEwen University for um, under one year, you've been faced with many challenges, and um, you've already challenged this idea of the university as merely being in the city. You, you're, you understand that it's not enough just to hope for inclusive societies. You actually have to take action. And your philosophy that the university must also integrate um, with and work for the city can be seen in your latest work, which has um, really recently been in the news. So I'm sure many of people have heard about it, but that you were recently called upon by city council to chair an independent task force on community wellness and safety. And that task force um, presented its findings this week um, to city council. And uh, that task force was a direct outcome of Black Lives Matter protests or the calls to action from the Black Lives Matter um, led protests, um, led marches this summer. And um, they were challenges to policing 
So this week, your task force that you chaired um, released the report, and the report has called for some significant changes to policing and to safety in uh, the city that you were part of, Edmonton Police Services. And the police chief has expressed his uh, disappointment, and he's declared the report to be inaccurate. And you've, de you've presented your 14, your task force has presented its 14 recommendations to city council and they're now gonna take their months to deliberate over recommendations. So no one said um, fostering engagement in the city or fostering change is gonna be easy, but Annette, I know that you're up for the challenge <laughs> and you're not backing down. So I know that we have a lot to talk about. Um, so thank you again to McEwen and to the conversation for organizing this event. And just so you know, before we start, McEwen University is a member of the Conversation Canada and you yourself, Annette, are on our board. Um, so I'm gonna jump right in, Annette, and I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about what I mentioned earlier, which is that you've been in this role about five months at the university and you've, you've started five months into, I'm gonna say it, the pandemic. <laughs> And um, I know that safety of students and faculty um, were really top priority um, on your mind, but as we mentioned that you've also been called to do this other massive duty, which is to chair this task force. Um, so uh, what, what you said, and one of the things that you said in this report is that Edmonton's community safety ecosystem desperately needs to be modernized. So can you tell us a little bit about this report? Like what are some of the things that you've recommended? I know it's a lot. Well, just tell me about this report. <laughs> I like open-ended questions. I like, <laughs> and I, I'm just pretending we're having a conversation on the phone because it's a little bit, you know, I'm watching the caption. I'm seeing myself on screen. I have a blanket on my legs, but I'm going to try and relax and just pretend we're talking. Yeah. By phone. It, it's great to, to be here with awesome. you. Today. And one of the things you said early, you talked about, um, you know, hope, hope, hope is not a strategy. Hope, hope is not enough, right? So I did arrive at McEwen University. Uh, I'm going to say in the middle of the pandemic, but it's not really the middle because we're still in the pandemic or panini or whatever your kids call it. <laughs> when the kids are a little older, they call it the pandemic. But in many ways, um, you know, I arrived in the middle of a triple pandemic um, in Alberta with the oil and gas situation and our economy changing so fast on top of the pandemic, and then you add to it the uh, racial reckoning. And my, my, my thinking has always been, and I've been um, a university president now, this is my second time. Mm -hmm. And the first time was at the University of Winnipeg. And when I arrived at the University of Winnipeg, they too had some fiscal challenges. And the city of Winnipeg, that was the year Winnipeg was declared the most racist city. That was the year Tina Fontaine was found in the Red River. Um, so, so there are some similarities. Um, one of the differences though, arriving this time at McEwen is I didn't have the luxury of in-person or time, right? Yeah. So, so you add the, the oil and gas, the pandemic and the racial reckoning. So I arrived at a very charged time. And part of what you do when you start at a new university is you really take the time to get to know people. You take the time to understand and you learn a lot by walking the halls. You learn a lot by attending seminars. I've been trying to do that, but Zoom isn't quite the same as uh, being there in person. So about the report, it's, it's really about a journey. And first, why did I say yes? I said yes. <laughs> you know, my husband said to me, why did you say yes? I said yes, because I, I think the role of a university is broad, teaching, research, and serving the public good. And by serving the public good, it really depends on, you know, how you see public good. So I, I think it is part of my role to be out there in community, providing some service. And in my past role, I often did things for, I, I, you know, I, I did a task for the city of Winnipeg. I did something for the federal government. I did something for the provincial government. So I do think that's a part of my expertise is process and I have been involved in a whole number of things. So I did it because McEwen is downtown. We are in the mix. We have a role to play in recovery, recovery defined in so many ways, bringing people back town, back downtown, the economic recovery in Edmonton, um, as well as we have a leadership role to play in anti-racism, equity, diversity, and inclusion. 
So mm -hmm. about the journey, I, I said yes. And, and part of why I also said yes is what the city did something very different. This is a task force like no other because they deliberately went out and asked a search firm to put together a task force with community members that had lived experience as well as a broad range of expertise. On top of that, they appointed members of the police service. They appointed a representative from the Edmonton Police Commission and they appointed two people from the city. I've never had the experience of working with such a diverse group. Mm. So part of it is I wanted to have the opportunity to learn from those task force members. And I was the late addition. They, they figured out who they wanted and then they sorted out who they wanted as chair. Mm. How was so, it cha chairing that kind of a diverse, you said you've never been such a part of a diverse group and you're the chair of, of a really diverse group. How was that for you? Well, it was uh, a lot of fun and very rewarding and tough emotionally sometimes. And we did all of our work through Zoom, no, actually Google in this very room. Um, and we did it in the evening and everybody on the task force has a complicated life uh, with jobs and children and all sorts of things to take care of. And mm -hmm. often people arrived and we'd start the meeting by you know, sharing their day. So um, I was so impressed. This was such an engaged group. They, they really laid their, bears, their, their souls bare. They were very open-minded and uh, we did things in a totally different way. So- yeah, we, sorry, I don't mean to ask you again. Through. I'm just so curious, like, the, so you start things in a different way, only because I think so many of us struggle with this when we're having these kinds of challenging conversations. I mean, the conversations must be really challenging when you're talking about policing and safety and community emotions. And you're saying that there's a mix of people, those who've got the experiential level, and then you've got the people who are maybe more theoretical about it. And then you've got the practitioners at this, you know, you've got. So how are you, how, what kind of techniques did you use? You said you, every, every meeting you started with sharing something about your day or is there, is there another technique that you want to, or secret that you're going to share with us about what happened in some of those meetings and how you did those? Well, part of it was how we started and obviously the beginning, the middle and the end. And in, in the middle, I mean, we started, many of you have been involved in very complicated uh, system type exercises that the role was huge because we were asked to look at how to make our city um, more safe and welcoming through an anti-racist lens. Yeah. And part of the pressure was this task force was, was created in response to the Black Lives Matter protests and a series of public hearings where the majority of the people that showed up at those public hearings called for a defunding of police. And in many instances, what they meant meant by defunding was to invest in things to reduce demand for police. Right. So although the scope was broad, one of the tensions in the group was the relative focus on policing compared to everything else in the community ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the report, there are recommendations on investing in other things in the ecosystem, for example, public washrooms, for example, indigenous shelters. One of the other tensions is today, city council will probably be releasing a report that speaks to all of the money flowing into Edmonton's social safety net, money from the federal government, provincial government, philanthropy. And what it demonstrates is there is a lot of money coming into the system overall. So I think one of the counter arguments to one of our recommendations, which was to freeze funding to police and take what they would normally get through a formula and invest mm -hmm. that into some things to reduce demand for police. Today, a report will come out and it will say there's so much money in the system. Really, the problem is just one of coordination. So maybe you could debunk or maybe explain something that I think is commonly, I mean, I think you touched on it just now, but the common misconceptions around what does defund the police actually mean when, you know, that's a sort of cry and, and, and you get this kind of immediate um, defensive reaction to that. There will always be a role for police. <laughs> the word defund though means different things to different people. The task force was clear in our report mm. that what we thought that word meant 
was to invest in services that would reduce demand for police. We did not recommend a cut in the police budget. We recommended a freeze. Right now, they get predictable increases year after year. And this was a decision made by city council a few years ago. And their thinking at the time was that this would depoliticize police funding, make it formulaic. That was a few years ago when everything was going up or everything was at least being maintained, but we're in a different cycle right now. So what we noticed was police funding was going up, but other preventative services funding was going down. Right. So it's not, it's not, it's not about getting rid of the police. It's about actually bolstering and boosting up other services that could help community services, things that you said, public washrooms, shelters, community services. Sure. And in terms of how the task force approached its work, there were a number of reports made available to us that were commissioned by the police service or the police commission or city council. There's a lot of information out there that members of the task force would collect and share. So we created a bit of a portal, but a lot of the work was actually done by subgroupings of the panel that would go away and put some thoughts together. So it was an interesting process to actually come down to 14 recommendations. And early on in the process, we decided that we didn't wanna have a million recommendations and that we wanted our recommendations to be doable and we wanted to get transformation through incremental change, which is sounds like a bit of uh, an oxymoron to transform the world through incremental change. But if you pick the right ones, uh, they start to feel doable and far less threatening to people. Yeah. I mean, when you look at the 14 recommendations, they don't sound, ex there's nothing in there to me that sounds extreme or you know, threatening, but, uh, but the, but one, you know, one of the things that I, I found really interesting was that the police, the police official response. And one of the things, I mean, it, it was generally um, negative as you, as you called it. But I also think that um, it was interesting to me to hear that, that one of the um, th things, one of the critiques about this report was that it was inaccurate or that it was under-researched. And uh, I'm wondering what you think, what your response is to that. We use publicly available data, and part of the sensitivity is always when you are comparing things like per capita spending on police, number of police officers per 100,000, you're always to some degree uh, comparing apples to oranges, right? So there was a pattern though. So we, we found the data we could find. We said Edmonton looks like a bit of a spending outlier. We noticed that other things were either frozen or decreasing. And to me, that, that's a pretty straightforward observation. So it was, you know, take a look. And we compared to other cities about the same size as Edmonton. Mm -hmm. So so again, um, the devil is always in the details, but, but the pattern is there. So that's why one of their um, motions was to go take a look at the funding formula, figure out who they want to compare themselves to. And where it gets interesting is we also recommended some funding be tied to performance. So what's interesting, do you get more as a police service when crime goes up or do you get more as a police service when crime goes down? Mm. Right, so you need, a, you need a suite of metrics. Mm. I mean, but some of those stats are indisputable in terms of the racial profiling of indigenous folks in Edmonton or of black folks in Edmonton. Some of those stats are just indisputable information. That's... Well, and, I, and again, it led to this conversation around what is evidence? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Right. And so for a number of the task force members, the days in between the release of the report and the actual presentation at City Hall were quite challenging because many of them felt that their lived experiences were not perceived as evidence. Right. And, and that's why, um, you know, I, I think we worked well as a team to try and tell our story on April the 6th. It is really challenging, I think, for when when we're asking, um, you know, when we're asking people to give their evidence to be witness to their experience. Um, it's one of the, you know, the. I'm going to say it's one of the the, the stresses that happens to I think especially um, Indigenous Black people, racialized people of color, when we're called upon to give our experience, you know, as evidence, and then on top of that, you're you're doubted or you're taken through this kind of critique in a, in a very public way. 
Yes, but you know, I am so proud of each and every task force member and we have created a bond, created a family. Our work is done and <laughs> that's hard for people to be honest with you and we should feel very good it's because so, we wrote it's, a brave report. I was going to say it's a impact. very brave, it's a very brave report that, that uh, kind of work that you've put out there. It's very brave. And I guess that's what I'm talking about. You have all the energy to do and the work that you put this brave report out and some of the challenge now is to, um, I mean, how to um, deal with the rollout of that, how to deal with, you know, how people are responding to that. Well, and, and now for me personally, um, another reason I said yes to this assignment was because I was away from Edmonton for six years. And so for me, it's a way to connect back to the city. And I wanna take what I've learned through this task force experience and think about these same issues on my own campus. The, the report of the task force is called Safer for All. Mm. And each and every campus in Canada, I mean, we are paying attention to equity, diversity, and inclusion, looking at our policies and procedures through an anti-racism lens. And we want our campuses to be safer for all. Although I might argue that I prefer the word brave and safety and bravery kind of go together. You can be brave if you feel safe, but I, I don't want people to think being safe means you're always comfortable because part of yeah. what university is all about is, is bringing you to things, new ideas that do sometimes make you feel uncomfortable. It's a really, brave. it's a really good point. See, on on campus these days, there's a conversation about, uh, you know, it's just going off of what you're saying about brave versus safe, and who who is allowed to feel safe on campus, and when do we challenge that safety, um, when we're challenging ideas that really shift and you know can make some people feel uncomfortable. Um, so on university campuses these days, as I'm sure you're aware, there's a really fierce and current conversation that's happening about, you know, free speech versus hate speech. Um, I don't know if you have any current ex examples that you want to talk about. I'm sure there are some, well, <laughs> because yes. I know there are some. No, there, there are always some. And, and again, you know, freedom of, freedom of expression in Canada is not like free speech, free speech in the States. And Freedom of expression doesn't allow for hate speech. How do you define hate speech? And you know, as well as I do, that often language is the center of these conversations. And mm -hmm. we are having some of those conversations right now in our classrooms at McCune University. And I'm aware of those issues. And part of what I think about as a president is the degree to which I put my energy into changing the system versus dealing with individuals instances where they happen and obviously we have to pay attention to both yeah but the, the real change is a systemic change so how do you make the systemic change when it comes to things like uh hate speech and language on campus do you start making you do start making policies around certain language and and doesn't that get tricky as language changes so quickly well, well exactly so i don't want to make it just about language Sorry that I, I led you into that. It sometimes centers around language, but I don't want to make it just about language. So, you know, part of it is um, this is about cultural change. Mm -hmm. And cultural change is influenced, obviously, by tone at the top. But I've also learned, this is my second time around as president, that I'm not a big fan of grand gestures and proclamations, moonshots, without really an understanding of how to accomplish that. I, I'm a believer in, in setting an aspiring and inspirational vision, but you still have to think it through. So I, I want to move beyond the superficial and beyond the obvious things and dig a little deeper. And at the end of the day, whether you're talking about reconciliation or racism yeah. or equity, diversity and inclusion, part of it is we need to put some thought to what gets taught how. By whom? Yeah. And if you think of a university campus, mm -hmm. the diversity of our students is always going to be ahead of the diversity of our faculty and staff as our society changes because our students are here <clears throat> for a couple of years and faculty and staff are here for decades, yeah. right? So we're mm -hmm. in this race and we're never going to catch up. So what do we do um, to try and at least, you know, try to catch up? So we have at McEwen done an inventory of all of our equity, diversity, and inclusion initiatives. And they're all over the place. Like there's so many grassroots initiatives. 
but I, I want to get some synergy from those initiatives. And, and so when you say grassroots, are you talking about, um, you know, from students or you're talking, uh, what, what do you, what kind of grassroots is it city um, led things or? No, I'm, I'm campus? talking uh, campus led. So, um, mm -hmm. um, Irfan Chowdhury, who was on the task yes. force with me, who's, who's in our human rights and diversity office. I should also mention, we had a student on there from uh, McEwen social work program. That was absolutely awesome. Layla Bellini. So students, faculty, the office of human rights and diversity, individual faculties have EDI committees. So there's a lot of activity. Mm. I'm trying to ensure that we get some synergy with all of that activity. And part of the role of leadership is to set, help set priorities and allocate resources. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a tough one. I mean, I, I just, you know, for me, I, uh, I'm thinking about my experience. I, I sat when I was a student activist at the University of Toronto, I sat on a, um, it was a presidential task force on race relations. I was a very vocal anti-racist activist um, in Toronto. And um, I think, to be honest, we were so active, like I actually have vague memories of, I'm going to say, I actually have vague memories of standing on top of the president's desk like, I think we were quite bold in our actions. And I think partly to kind of, uh, we, we actually got quite a lot done. And one of the things that happened is um, an EDI officer was appointed for the first time at the University of Toronto as a result of our activism. Mm -hmm. We had a group, um, the group was called the United Coalition Against Racism. And then the Toronto city chapter was the Toronto Coalition Against Racism. And I remember feeling even at 20 something at the time as an undergrad that um, I was being asked to sit on the presidential task force because it was it was safer <laughs> for them to have me sitting at the table than standing on top of the oh, table. Oh, that's, that's a great metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> so I just, I feel like that once I got onto that task force and I sat every week with the president, Robert Pritchard at, at the time of, of U of T with his, uh, with with the head of EDI, Kelvin, Professor Kelvin Andrews, and, and many others from the community. We sat every week, we came up with these great bold ideas. And I feel like we got, it was my first lesson in getting weighed down by policy and getting weighed down in process. And then mm -hmm. feeling like, you know, I was younger too, but I, I really wanted things to happen faster. Um, and so I'm just wondering how you, that's, I guess what I'm trying to ask you is how do you deal with this weight of policy that can slow us down? Well, you know, what, what you've raised is quite interesting because um, I'm thinking of the intergenerational differences and what did your dad teach at the university? At which yeah, you know, yeah so my dad table? also taught there. <laughs> okay, good for you. Um, I'm sure that meant for some interesting family conversations. Yes. I mean, yeah. obviously you can try and make change from the outside. You can try and make change from the inside. Most of my career has been on the inside. I've had the privilege. I've been in powerful roles. I've been a deputy. I've been a university president. This task force gave me a real feel for being on the outside, trying to yeah. cause change from the outside, yeah. right? And, and there are different ways to try and cause change. Yeah. And, you know, I want to drive those changes that are going to have the most transformative impact. On every change initiative that I've ever experienced, I, I'm not a statistician like your father, but I always think in terms of bell curves and distributions, there's always a group of people that really want change and are for change and they spend a lot of time together. And then there's a group of people who resist change. They too spend a lot of time together. And then there's people in the middle that both sides are vying for to join mm -hmm. their side. And I think on a lot of issues that middle, you know, why are they in the middle? Well, either they don't really know, they don't know the truth, they don't understand. So, so you know, some training might help or they're afraid of change or they just don't know what to do. And so, um, you know, I'm always aiming to work with the middle and, and pull them to the change side and understand, you know, their motivations for being in the middle. And on our task force, um, many of the members would say anti-racism is a verb. You're either racist or anti-racist. And I know many individuals on my campus would say, well, that's too simple. You know, there is a middle, there is a middle. And, you know, are they racist? Are they anti-racist? Well, they're part of a system that has structures embedded in it. We all have our unconscious biases. And, yeah. you know, one of the podcasts, you had one of your, your guests talk about um, how, you know, she encourages people to think of the first time in the most 
memorable, well, what a, what a the most impactful time when they yes. learn about race differences, right? So mm -hmm. anyways, I, I think part of it is, is giving people some solutions to do the right thing, because I actually think people want to do the right thing. You know, you can't be a, a you can't be an activist or you, you can't be doing the kind of work you're doing without being a complete optimist and believing that people can change. This is the this is the never ending thing about the activist. You must be hopeful. Otherwise. No, absolutely. And, and it's <laughs> funny in the debrief after the report was out, you know, some of the members of the task force were saying, oh, I feel so naive. Uh, but by the end of the conversation, you know, they were feeling hopeful. You, you know what I'm getting at? Because, you know, they were taken a little back, uh, aback by the, uh, some of the reaction. But at the same time, you know, let's be enthusiastically optimistic because City Council has said they're going to take 90 days. They're going to figure out which of those recommendations they can act on quickly. And they're going to, they will develop a joint strategy that is informed by our report. So we should feel good. Well, you know, there's a, there's a, there's the balance. I mean, of course, as an activist, we do have to remain optimistic, but uh, essentially as an anti-racist activist, I think there is also a, a deep um, embedded skepticism that's also necessary because we know the systems are in place and the systems are designed, um, you know, to, to keep us in, in a certain, in certain places. And so you, you have to have optimism, I think, but we also have to, in order to keep going, we have to remember the system is in place and, and it's the systems that we're trying to break down. And, and again, you know, change requires momentum, change requires leadership, and there's always a tendency to swing back. Yeah. And in my life, prior life as a deputy minister, when it came to policy, I was always worried about overswings, right? So, so something is called out, there's a, there's a reaction, and sometimes it's an overreaction. And, you know, that, that, too, the ways too far back and forth are not good for people either. I prefer kind of continuous momentum in the right direction. Let, let me talk to you a little bit, something com completely different just for a minute. And it's something I've been thinking about, especially as we're on this, I mean, I, hi everybody. <laughs> I, I realize that we're on a video call, although it's, I'm only <laughs> looking at you and you're looking at me, but um, I, I saw myself smile uh, the other just just a second ago, and I and I was thinking about women leaders. And I read an article the other day, actually, on our conversation website about women leaders, and um, it was it was talking about young young girls and smiling, and how we you know we we don't have to smile, we shouldn't have to smile to make people feel comfortable. And um, you know, I'm just wondering what are the unique you know if you if you think about some of the unique challenges of being a, a woman and being a leader, especially. I know there's studies um, on campus that talk about, you know, um, students in student evaluations, for example, students expect their professors to be nurturing if they're female, or, you know, they expect, we expect certain things from women leaders. Um, and you have been a, a public servant for, for more than 15 years in government, but also now, as you say, twice as university president, as a woman leader, do you have some specific challenges that you want to talk about as a female in power? Well, you know, I will say early days um, when I crossed the river from the U of A, where I was doing my postdoc to work for the province of uh, Alberta, you know, I, I tell people that I had a lot of very good mentors, but truth be told, um, I really learned how to fit into the system that was very, in the first department I was in, very male engineer dominated. And so I, I tell people, um, you know, the female leaders before me had to really push their way in. I felt invited to the table, but I really had to adopt the norms of the table. And I think this next generation will change the table. So, so you know, rather than just fit in, they will demand change. And that's why it gives me such pride to work at a university and interact with young people. I will say as a university president, as a Métis university president, one of the things I learned at the University of Winnipeg, remember I arrived there in 2014, uh, Tina Fontaine's death, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, mm -hmm. you, Winnipeg being called the most racist city. Yeah. We, you know, we were on a nice trajectory in terms of indigenization, but I learned quickly not to promise things I couldn't deliver. And I also learned that I couldn't, um, I, I was held to a different standard than let's say some of my male counterparts who got a lot of kudos for a lot of apologies and grand statements. I, I really felt I had to deliver. 
And I don't know if I was imagining what people expected of me or this was what I expected of me, but this is why I, I'm very careful. And you know, to be honest, it means I make mistakes sometimes because there are times when I don't rush in to say what people hope I say. It's very difficult as a university president to speak on behalf of the university community. Mm -hmm. How often do you do that? And in a lot of universities, there's constant pressure on the pressure on the president to make a statement on behalf of everybody. Yeah. And you know, I, I I got trapped a couple of times where you know I called out something before it happened, and then it didn't happen. So it's almost as though you know there are traps set for you to fall into, and and then you get into trouble. I want to ask you more about that, but I'm also looking at the time. I can't, you know what? I do feel like I lost, we we got into a little bit of a phone call type conversation and I'm losing track of time. So I'm conscious of everybody's time too. And I, 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 I you, you said something about, you know, I, um, I'm just going to share a little bit of a personal story about my life, which is um, you're talking about being a woman leader. And uh, I can tell you many stories myself about feeling um, held to a different standard um, at the front of the classroom or at the front of a meeting or any of these things where I think people are expecting something different from me because I'm a woman. They want me to be um, nicer and I'm not that nice sometimes. They want me to be, you know, they, they want me to be nicer. I'm not. I, I, I want to say what I want to say when I want to say it. And, um, and, 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 you know, I'm not, I'm not your mother. I am somebody's mother, but I'm not your mother. So, you know, there's all of these kinds of these kinds of things. Um, but we've been talking a little bit about, um, you know, uh, telling personal stories and how our personal stories also impact the work that we do. Um, so for me, my, um, I grew up hearing stories of the Brit British colonialism. My parents both grew up under Brit British colonial rule in India. And um, so there was no way that I was, I was going to go about in the world without a critique of British colonialism, which also includes Canada. And um, when we moved, to, when my parents moved to Canada, and this is how I was raised with this very kind of mind frame. And um, recently, I, I'm sure everybody remembers the story of um, Joyce Echequan in Quebec, who uh, was uh, who died in the hospital and recorded her own death and uh, the racism that she experienced just before she died. And my daughter was trying to think about what she could do here in Ontario, in Toronto. What could she do? She's 11 years old. She's in grade six. She's a very law abiding, you know, 11 year old. Um, and she decides I'm not going to stand for the Canadian national anthem today. And this whole week, I'm not going to stand. And this is a huge deal for her because she's so, by the book. She's one of those by the book mm -hmm. kids. So she calls her grandmother, my mom, and says, what should I do? Should I stand or not stand? And um, my mom says, you know, my mom who grew up in Delhi, my grandfather was a journalist. So my mom grew up in poverty because her dad was always writing about the British government and always getting <laughs> thrown in jail. So, so this, these are the stories. I mean, so my, my mom says to her, uh, you come from a long line of activists you sit down when they play <laughs> the national anthem, like sit down, do mm. not stand up. And I think part of, so part of that bravery of being able to go out in the world as an activist and also the knowledge that, that I have comes from, comes from those stories. Um, and, and it's very motivating to me. It, it helps me walk with a sense of purpose and a sense of mission. And of course, I didn't just remain there, but that is help that helped sparked me and, and set me on on that. I'm just wondering if you have some, some of your own personal motivations like that from your identity, from your community. Well, thanks, Vanita. So for me, growing up in Winnipeg in the 60s um, in a Métis family was kind of interesting because it was a time when you were really encouraged to um, not share that identity. And yeah. depending on how you looked, and I'm from a large family, and I was kind of in the middle in terms of how people saw my indigeneity. And you know, my earliest memory of um, becoming aware of race was when I walked down the street and this little old lady that I used to visit, um, I was quite young, but we were free range children. Like we could kind of, we were not so supervised as uh, children are today. And I used to chat with this lady and you know, she pulled me aside when I was about five and said, you know, 
if you wash your skin with lemons, oh. you will whiten up and nobody will know. So I, you know, I went home and got the SOS and luckily my mother found me before I did too much damage, but you know, those sorts of memories. And then, um, you know, I, I think in terms of the powerful women in my life, like my Métis grandmother, the beauty of her was she was just so accepting of anything and everything. Like she was so optimistic um, and she was just so chill, chill, chill. You, you know what I mean? Like just the chillest person you could ever meet. Uh, the most loving person you could ever meet and you know get which gives confidence right because absolutely zero judgment and yeah. then my mother very grounded when I went off to school so you know there weren't a lot of people in my family that had gone to school my older sister um, there was a program you could become a teacher in a year uh, other than that you know first first generation and my mother used to constantly tell me you know what I love about you Annette is you've gone to school You've got all these degrees, but you're still very grounded. You haven't forgotten where you've come from. So I, I'd say both of those um, just remind me of just how privileged I am and how other people don't have the same opportunities I have. So I would like to say I use the power I have. I try and be responsible with the power I have. Well, it sounds like you are, you are out, out in the world. I mean, the, the question of um, why you do what you do, you know, your husband asking you why, why did you sit on this committee? I mean, it, 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 it is a very brave thing to do. You've put yourself in the center of a little bit of a storm. Yes, I have. The task force work is done. I'm moving on, <laughs> back to campus. Um, all that being said, I've got a lot to do on campus and um, we're going through a strategic visioning exercise, trying to figure out where what we want to be in 2030. We're having these conversations, equity, diversity, and inclusion are definitely coming up as yeah. is reconciliation, as is recovery in its fullest form. And the thing about McEwen that I love is uh, they have embraced being a downtown university and there is a real desire to be connected with community, uh, to be porous and, and to have impact. And there's a lot of openness uh, to really um, thinking about students and how the world of work is changing and how people will be learning continuously. They will be moving in and out of our systems. And, you know, I'd like to say um, it's a very open-minded university, right? It's, it's quite a humble university that, that I, I think people don't understand uh, just what we have been contributing and what we do have to contribute. I think we're the type of university, when you say universities are expected to do better, yes. um, like we are doing better. Uh, and, and again, you know, we're more nimble, we're more flexible, we're more student-centered. The research we do tends to be more interdisciplinary. We are connected with community. We're in a very interesting spot downtown in Edmonton, near the ICE district, near the arts district, with a number of not-for-profit social enterprises and social service agencies just north of us. So we're, we're in the mix. So let's so say you get a sudden windfall of cash. What would you do? What, what would your dream thing to do be? Do you have some dream projects? Oh, I think if we, we got a bunch of cash, um, you know, I, I kind of see my job as we've got this ecosystem of incredibly creative academic entrepreneurs, right? Yeah. So, so I would just find some seed money so they could go out and do what they want to do. So, so just more of that enabling, um, unleash, you know, all the capacity we have at McEwen to go change the world however they want to change the world. I mean, it definitely shatters all those ideas of the ivory tower, right? This idea that you are there by yourself and you're creating research. I mean, it actually enables and helps researchers to have their research have an impact. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and this way our missions are aligned because that's what we do at the conversation too. We, <laughs> we're trying to get, um, you know, space for our researchers and academics to be out there in the world and, um, not that they're not, but just to have that message, you know, be known. Well, again, I think people forget teaching research, serving the public good. We're full of thought leaders and we're full of people who serve the community in a whole variety of ways. And I, and I think we need to talk about that a little bit more, which is why I like what the Conversation Canada does, because it's a way of amplifying mm -hmm. the work done on our campuses. And again, our faculty members have full academic freedom. They can go study whatever they want. Right. And they do. That I've heard the new, uh, you know, just talking about how language changes, EDI, but now EDID, equity, diversity, inclusion, and decolonization. 
Well, you know what? I'm careful with that word decolonization. We are a provincial university mm. uh, we created in, in law. And, um, you know, I, that's a moonshot I'm not promising. Yeah. So I like to think of inclusion and reconciliation in terms of sense of belonging, uh, more diversity, and thinking carefully what we teach, how we teach it, who teaches, and having a faculty and student body that is more reflective of the students showing up on our campus virtually and in person. I, I like that last thing that you said because um, it, 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 it is that fine balance of optimist plus skeptical, you know, plus being skeptic, plus a skeptic. So you're the optimist, the activist optimist, but you're also the skeptic because you're saying you understand that you are part of a system that is still colonized. Well, and uh, Rai Moran from the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, I remember having this conversation with him. And, and I would say, Rai, when I meet elders and they talk about their grandkids, they're very proud that their grandkids have credentials from our colonial institutions. And I'd say, you know, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. That's a ridiculous expression. Uh, but he said, but the bathwater's dirty. And I said, yes, like we'll, <laughs> we'll work on that. But I, right. I, again, I mean, metaphors are kind of wild and we have to trash a lot of the metaphors we've used in the past and create some new ones, but. Okay, I know we're out of time, Annette, I'm sorry. I, I'm looking at the time, I'm way over and I, um, are we okay? I know somebody's list, somebody's somebody's doing a timekeeper for us, and maybe they can check. Maybe Craig can check in for us. I I have this quote that I have to say as I'm as I'm going to say thank you and close up. But I read something that you said the other day, and it's it's this: as a leader of the university, I tell people our role is to absorb chaos, portray calm, and convey hope. But I'm going to add a fourth one: our role as leaders is also to bring out the best in people. Yes. And Thank you very much for um, spending your time with me today and um, for for sharing all of that information with us. Um, Craig, I, I'm going to ask you to just jump back on and tell us how we are doing with time. <laughs> you're, you're actually fine, Benita. <laughs> <laughs> I, pro I thought I promised to end at 11.15, so I just wanted to check in. I, I'm never one to want to stop a, a <laughs> experience, so... Uh, yeah, thank you very much, both of you. And Annette, thank you so much for spending all your time today. Is there a question that you wish that I had asked? I, I just want to comment on your last one, uh, bringing out the best in people, because it really yeah. is about, you know, bringing out all the capacity. And if I go back to the task force one more time, part of our message was there are a lot of people in the community safety and well-being ecosystem. And help them um, because there's a ton of capacity there to help others, right? So I believe ecosystems are more resilient when they are diverse and don't call me resilient. No, just kidding. Um, you, know. <laughs> you can say that, you know, this whole thing about resilient being a bad word, it, it, we, we are resilient. We do have to acknowledge our resilience, but at the same time, we're just, we can't rely on that. It's not fair okay. to keep relying on that resilience. And I thought you'd ask me if I'm going to be vaccinated soon. And I am. So you are. That's my good news of the day. I'm that is I, fantastic. I theoretically news. have to at the end of the day. So at the end of the day, that's great. Congratulations. That's a big one. So mm -hmm. I know we I as we live in this, I mean, I crazy uh pandemic, the the um I'm glad to hear that. That's really good news. Congratulations on that. I'm waiting still <laughs> in Ontario. We're still waiting, but it'll happen soon. We're, we're at the, we're, we see something, at least some bright light there at the end. And I don't say end as a, a real end, but you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you, Vanita. It's been a pleasure. Thank you everybody for staying with us and, and hanging out and um, being part of this conversation. There, as you know, there's so much more we could talk about, as you know, we could go on for another 45 minutes, but I know we have to stop. Possibly we can do a sequel to this one day, because I'm sure there was a lot of uh, conversations that we were cut short due to time. But I'd like to thank uh, uh, Annette Benita for, uh, I think, you know, just the, the remarkable conversation. I mean, I think you touched on a lot of topics and raised a lot of key issues. And, 
and, and you know, to use a term that Nets used before, enlightenment. I think a lot of people will come away from this uh, more enlightened about a lot of different issues. And, and it gives us the lens to look at these challenging issues differently and to think about them differently. And that's what post-secondary education, that's what we try to do. I really love, I'm going to walk away from this conversation with the idea of a brave space versus a safe space. I think it's a really good one to keep in mind that we can't keep everybody safe when we're challenging ideas. So thank you for that.